Welcome to the Entrepreneur on Campus podcast. Let's go. My name is Matthew Brown. I'm a student, I'm an entrepreneur, and I love learning. I've created this podcast to help you discover hidden opportunities. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Today I interviewed Chase Bryan, and Chase was awesome. Chase has worked with Anderson CRG for the past about four years. And Anderson CRG is a brokerage company, commercial brokerage company in Utah. And they've been the, one of the top 10 brokerage companies, even though they only have two people that work for them, Chase and his partner. And those two have just really done well here in, in this local community where I'm from. And so Chase really talked, he opened up a lot about what the commercial real estate industry is like, what a brokerage is, what an agent does, how hard it is to become an agent and what it requires. And um, he talked about the pros and cons of, of being an agent. And it's really a great opportunity for those that are interested in getting involved with real estate to see if they want to become a real estate agent, if they want to become a residential or a commercial agent, um, or if it's not a space for them. And hopefully during the interview, you'll be able to know a little bit better uh, if you'd like to be involved with the industry. And if not, then at least you know more about it. So hope you guys enjoy this. Chase is awesome. Uh, here it is with Chase Bryan. Awesome. Today I'm here with Chase Bryan. Thanks for joining me for this interview, Chase. Absolutely. Great to be here. So I'm excited to learn a little bit. You're a commercial real estate agent, and I'm excited to learn a little bit about that industry. And <clears throat> actually, I, I was just telling you, I don't know. I know a little bit about it, but there's a lot I don't know. So I'm excited to learn a little bit. But I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your kind of history. Um, do you feel like, I'll just ask this question, do you feel like you were born an entrepreneur? Or did you stumble upon it? Uh, from an early age, I was interested in making money. <laughs> so uh, it started with just mowing lawns and weeding neighbors' flower beds and uh, working for myself. I had also like sweep out houses under construction and did some electrical work. Um, so I think my personality is fit and geared more towards an entrepreneur, just mm -hmm. self-motivated. I think some of that is inherent, like um, looking at my siblings, I don't think some of them would do very good working for themselves. Mm. I guess it depends on the space, but there is some, definitely some natural uh, qualities that you qualities. possess that yeah. help you. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I did see on your LinkedIn that you created a, a lawn mowing business and you mowed a lot of lawns. Yeah. My, uh, my prize number was mowing over a thousand lawns this my senior year of high school wow. and I had some friends working with me too but um, yeah at the end of the year when I was running our numbers and whatnot we, we mowed over a thousand lawns that year and I was blown away. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot. But it made me miss some uh, football games and things like that. Um, I wasn't on the football team but um, it was a great decision and helped me get into college and pay my way through. And cool. So very I cool. learned a lot of lessons on how to run a business and just by the simple lawn mowing model. And when did you start uh, be to become a, a real estate, commercial real estate agent? Yeah, so that happened here while I was at BYU. Um, one of the good friends I met in the dormitories, uh, we stuck together. We were both going through the business program and we were both interested in real estate. And so he said, you know, we should really get our licenses. And at the time, we didn't know what we would use those for. <laughs> we were uh, sophomores, I think. And so I said, okay, and signed up for the first class. It was free online. And then I was ready for the second class, and I had to pay. And I said, are we doing this? And he said, yeah. And so I paid and started again. A couple weeks later, I asked him how his courses were going, and he had never paid. <laughs> but I had uh, committed. Uh, I had committed, and so I kind of sat there for a little bit. I, there wasn't a real urge for me to get it. I didn't have a job or anything, but I'm sure glad I did because I knew real estate was a space that a lot of people I uh, looked up to and wanted to kind of emulate were in, 
and by getting my license it showed commitment to the industry, it showed that I was serious about it, and then by just having that, a lot of doors opened up for me to learn, because quite frankly, I didn't know anything mm -hmm. about commercial real estate or even residential real estate mm -hmm. prior to having that, but I just knew it was a stepping stone and the first thing I needed to do. Right, and it's a pretty low barrier entrance is what I've heard, right? Is yeah. It just takes a couple of weeks or a couple of months and you can become a real estate agent, right? Yeah. So everyone knows somebody who's a real estate agent. Yep. It, uh, the barrier to entry isn't super big, but the state has requirements for how many hours you need with education and stuff like that. Uh, but I think anyone can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> so. And when you become a real estate agent, you become a residential and a commercial real estate agent. It's not two separate licenses. Correct. It's the same license and uh, you can decide kind of where you dedicate yourself. Okay. And that, as an agent, do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? I do, yeah. It's uh, a lot of problem solving and I, I work with one other guy, a, a team member, and so together it's, it's our business. We got to go out and chase our own deals and um, we, we do everything we can to be profitable in the sense of uh, maintaining the costs of our marketing and um, our, our time. Uh, time is money too. We don't. We, we really have to be careful about what deals we chase because you can chase deals that never come to fruition or work really hard for a deal with a really low commission. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And does your company act as a broker? Uh huh. So I don't have, it's two separate licenses, a sales agent license and a brokerage license. You have to be an agent for a certain amount of time and do so much in transactions and um, all the agents are under the umbrella of, an, of a broker. And so um, I'm not a broker, I'm just an agent, but uh, my broker is Anderson CRG. Gotcha. And so your partner of the company mm -hmm. Is he your broker or yeah, the he, company? He is. Well, he, he is the broker. He's got the brokerage license. Okay. And the name of the brokerage is Anderson CRG. And can you help just explain, like, what is it that a broker does? What is it that an agent does? So it's, it's really protection. Uh, an agent acts in the name of your broker. So if I ever make a mistake, um, if I mess up, they come to the brokerage and it's kind of like a firewall between me and uh, any litigation or gotcha. any problems we have. Um, so all the deals I do, they're, I'm the agent and the brokerage is Anderson CRG and so uh, if there's problems, people just look to the brokerage. And Does it ever penetrate the brokerage and get to the agent? Some litigation or something? Um, not that I'm aware of. It's yeah. a good question. It's probably a question on the brokerage <laughs> license. Yeah, right. But uh, no, and typically, I mean, I haven't been involved in anything. But as long as you're ethical and uh, work hard, you shouldn't have any problems. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the so the agent. So what is it that an agent does? And then how does like the revenue split between the agent and the brokerage. Yeah, so that's totally negotiable. Uh, a lot of different brokerages will try and attract people by offering different splits. And so it just depends on where you decide to go, but that's a deal you negotiate with your broker. And an agent will do the deal, but the money comes to the brokerage. So if you get a commission of $10,000, the $10,000 goes to the brokerage. And then depending on your agreement, you'll get 70% or 80%, 90%. And whatever the brokerage keeps, that's the money that they use uh, to pay for office equipment, printers, fax machines, office managers, um, all the marketing, like uh, listings on the internet, uh, subscriptions to data, uh, signs that they put out on the street. Whatever money the brokerage keeps typically goes to those mm -hmm. operating costs. Is there a traditional kind of split that most people do? 
I think here in the valley, a lot of it you'll see at about 70%. Mm -hmm. uh, to the agent. Yeah, to the agent, a 70-30 split. Uh, sometimes it's 50-50. It kind of depends on your, um, your experience and also your, the volume that you do. Lots of times you'll start at 50 or 70%, and then as you uh, complete $100,000 in transactions, then it'll go to 75%, or you'll have these 5% bumps as you gotcha. go 80%, 85 So Cool. So as we were talking a little bit yesterday, um, you mentioned a local building and that you're trying to lease uh, spaces in that building, right? Mm -hmm. So how did like, how did you even get that? Does the owner of that building like come to your firm and say, hey, I want help finding people to lease my spaces? And then you say, yeah, we'll do it. Is that what happens? A lot of times it is, yeah. People see our signs around and they see that we have a lot of listings and that we do a lot of transactions. And so uh, they'll call and say, will you help me with my property? A lot of times as well, it's uh, through the network that we gain by going to different business events or mm -hmm. chamber meetings, uh, just kind of as we're here in the valley, locally participating in the community, you meet business owners and uh, people see what you're doing, and so word spreads pretty quickly. Right. Even though you only have two people, you yeah. guys still have a decent sized reputation. Yeah. Yeah. We've been in the top ten uh, brokerages in Utah for the last couple of years. Wow. We're certainly the the smallest <laughs> yeah. of the groups. A lot of other uh, brokerages have anywhere from 20 to 30 to 50 agents. Why are you guys so small? Uh, by design, it's kind of just to keep keep the office chill and uh, not a lot of overhead. Not a lot of overhead. We keep we just do the deals we want, really. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's hard to tell people, you know, we're probably not the best fit for you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but we really focus on working with the clients and the projects that we're interested in and uh, have been able to, to do a lot of deals personally as well just because we don't have to worry about other mm -hmm. complications within a brokerage. Right. Um, so just going back to what I was saying before, so let's say that an owner of a building, Tim, comes to you. He's like, hey, Chase, um, I'd love if you guys could help lease my space. And then how do you go about getting people to lease that space? Yeah, that's a great question. And that really distinguishes uh, a good agent or a good brokerage from a, an average or a bad broker. And so we're premium members on a bunch of different multiple listing services on, online. That's how a lot of people look for properties that are available. Uh, we'll always put our sign in front of buildings like you see a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, what are the main listing websites? So LoopNet yep. is probably the, the biggest, the industry leader. Uh, Crexy is coming on pretty strong. Um, those are the the two. CoStar is similar to LoopNet; they're owned by the same group. Uh, but between those three, you capture gotcha. most of the market. Okay, sorry, that was a quick interruption. Yeah, that's but okay. <laughs> you were just talking about um, finding the people to mm -hmm. lease the space. Yeah, and then your book of business really comes into play there. So if I, I've already got a history with a lot of different companies, I can uh, take the property to them. And well, how do you have a history with them? Did you one time just email them or like cold? Yeah, e either. It started being, cold usually or? It started cold or I met them at a different event. There's uh, national conventions I go to and meet with different uh, retailers or companies and so that's really beneficial mm -hmm. to collect business cards and know what people need and what they're looking for and so then when we have something that fits their needs uh, we email it over to them and there's a lot of people who come here uh, Utah is such a great market right now we have different acquisition firms flying in and they'll call us up to meet with us and ask us what we have and uh, really they can't find enough product to buy <laughs> really because uh, the market's just so hot right now mm -hmm. so that's really nice and a great way to meet people that have capital that want to uh, buy properties and so uh, the last email I sent out today was just updating a group from Colorado that's looking for a place to put a bunch of money and 
office buildings and with the high, put money in office buildings like they want to purchase them. They want to buy the office building. Yep. Okay. They'll be the the landlord or the owner, and then they'll lease it to other companies. It's just like owning an apartment complex, but it's an office building. So what would your role be if they're wanting to purchase a place? Are you, you're the one that's connecting them with the owner of the building and saying, let's negotiate this sale, right? Exactly. So you do sales as well as um, leases. As well as leases, uh -huh. both. So in this particular case, yeah, we, I, I'm aware of a building. I've worked with the owner before um, that's got some vacancy in the building. So uh, we call that upside. You buy it at a, a lower price because it's not 100% leased. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll also, once they close on the building, then we'll lease up those vacant spaces for them and they can capture some of that upside. Hmm. Gotcha. So. Okay. So I know a little bit about like commercial real estate. What if I became a commercial real estate agent? Mm -hmm. What would I be surprised by as an agent? Just like day one, just going to go work, like, what am I going to be surprised by? What do you think? Uh, the thing that surprised me when I first started, um, I was working in college. I, I started just kind of as an intern at a firm, and I was writing these contracts, and uh, it was actually, well, I think it's okay to say it, it was the Los Hermanos building on Center Street in mm -hmm. Provo, and we were making offers on it, and I was like we were negotiating with hundreds of thousands of dollars, and here I was in college at BYU paying like four thousand a semester in tuition, mm -hmm. and, and that was a lot. <laughs> and that was a lot, and now I'm um, representing somebody with, and we're swinging two hundred thousand um, dollars back and forth mm -hmm. as counter offers, and I'm I just thought, wow, that's two hundred thousand dollars. Like he doesn't really blink. Like we can come up that much. Like, Wow, like it was just a lot of money for mm -hmm. me, and I realized, wow, I'm participating in some really cool big projects, mm -hmm. and so Los Hermanos was just one of the tenants. It it included the right the rest of the building upstairs. So I'm curious, also, what kind of a daily schedule for you looks like? Is it different every day, or is it doing a lot of the sim same things? Yeah, fairly similar, and that's what attracted me to commercial real estate was it was more fixed uh, than residential. So I go in during business hours, uh, Monday through Friday, typically 9 to 5, sometimes early, sometimes late, uh, depending on what's going on. But consists a lot of uh, emails, uh, following up with people that are interested in, in our properties. I'll come in and see the different leads that we have from our online listings answer their questions, set up showings, times to go and look at office spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I also, if I've answered everyone's questions and everything's good, then I'll look and see what properties we have listed and start calling interested people who I think would be interested and let them know that we have a space available that would fit their needs really well and try and recruit them to take uh, some of the buildings that we own. Mm -hmm. So it's manage. really just reaching out to people all the time. Oh, yeah. That's a huge part. It's talking to people. So it's a, a very uh, people-oriented business, mm. and extroverts do really well. If you love talking to people mm. and making connections, and it's a good spot to be. Yeah. So I know another commercial real estate. He was a broker. Mm -hmm. He owned his own brokerage firm in California, and he said... What really made him successful, I'd love to have him on the podcast too, but what really made him successful was, he said it was the number of people that he could call without them getting mad at him like past 7 o'clock and, and just being okay with it. Yeah. So that, that's exactly like what defined his success is like having enough people that were friends with him that they weren't bugged when he called them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm surprised that people who, who take my calls as well big CEOs and uh, the, usually it's the principals of these businesses that make the call on their, their real estate mm -hmm. um, unless they're so big that they specifically have a real estate department. Uh, some of the national groups uh, will obviously have that, but uh, it's great to have uh, company owners 
personal contact info because they mm -hmm. want to know exactly when we get a response on the deal that we offer on. And so it's yeah. great. How big is follow up? It's huge. Follow up is what gets deals made. And if you don't follow up, then it's going to fall through the cracks or people are going to forget. They're going to put their attention on whoever is constantly feeding them information and following up. And uh, I would say that's, that's huge. Yeah. And do you find that people, it ever ruins relationships? Well, no. Um, they'll be pretty frank. If it's not going to work, they'll just tell you um, it's not going to work for this reason. And then I try and uh, find a solution to that problem. If it's like there's not enough parking spaces, see how we can expand that. If there's uh, adjacent land we could uh, acquire and build more parking spaces. Or if it's uh, zoning, how can we work with the city to get amendment to the, the zoning map. So, yeah, it's... And then if you can't solve the problem, you still reach out to them and say, like, try, no. try to maintain the relationship at least? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or right. I, yeah, we just go to the next property, the next building, and say, okay, well, I understand this doesn't work, but we have other options. And hmm. Because of... Uh, people want their money at work, so people either want their money invested in a property or they want to sell the property and have it available to do something else with. So I, I, I love real estate and I believe in it because it's a need for a lot of people. Yeah. It, it, it's a product that they, they're interested in and that historically has provided great results. It's a safe investment. Uh, historically, your property is always going to appreciate. You'll have ups and downs, but... If you hold it long enough, mm -hmm. typically do really well. So, right, uh, I feel confident in the product that I'm selling, and feel like I can help a lot of people with it. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that um, everybody knows a real estate agent, right? Mm -hmm. And usually, when you think of a real estate agent, you think of a residential mm -hmm. real estate agent. Um, I was mentioning to you yesterday as well that I feel like commercial real estate is kind of like the dark side of real estate like nobody right. knows about it especially when I'm like the general public they just don't think like they don't understand what a commercial real estate agent does and and how to get involved with that so I'm curious what the advantages to being a commercial real estate agent versus a traditional real estate agent are yeah so I think one of the benefits is that there's less people doing it um, Another benefit is that they're uh, a lot bigger deals. Uh, sometimes that can be a benefit, sometimes that can be a detriment because you'll go longer in between. But uh, I think a lot of people are, are familiar and they know of somebody that needs to buy a house. And so they get started first in, in residential because they mm -hmm. know somebody there. I, I was really lucky to get an internship with a commercial real estate group. and. Uh, fit in really well so was extended offers to this day and helped me get my foot in the door but um, I think a lot of it my uncle who's in real estate he talks a lot about uh, trouts and marlins you can go fish and have a bunch of trouts up on your wall and it's great you can catch a lot of trout a lot of people are familiar with trouts there's mm -hmm. a lot of rivers with trouts but uh, if you have a marlin on your wall that's a that's a talking point, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it's harder to catch. Uh, you got to go to specific places, and uh, it takes more time. But one marlin's probably more of a talking point than ten trout on your wall. <laughs> Worth a lot more. <laughs> yeah. So sim similarly, I think there's a lot of people who jump into uh, residential real estate because it's accessible, and mm -hmm. more people are buying homes than buying businesses or commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, the prices are, the sizes are bigger. More people have mm -hmm. $250,000 to buy a house than a million dollars to buy an office right. building. So um, that's kind of the main difference. But the other big thing is kind of the, the hours. I wanted weekends and evenings to do what I wanted. And when you're a residential agent, it's whenever. <laughs> it's whenever. And usually you're showing people properties when they're off of work and on the weekends when they're free. 
And so commercial is the exact opposite. You're dealing with the business people on the business hours. And you, you stay Monday through Friday. It's really nice. Yeah. It was a lifestyle decision for me. Cool. Um, so another question that I had was a lot of people that I've talked to, they've, they've stated like that the real estate industry is 20 years behind in the sense that there's a lot of new technology. The real estate industry is extremely old and it's, it is adapting, but it's adapting very slowly. Uh, what general trends have you seen in the real estate? commercial real estate industry and how that's changing. Yeah, I heard that a lot too. And so I tried to think of different things I could do within the industry to update it. And now I've been doing it for a number of years and I've slid right into the, the, traditional. the routines and the traditions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I have seen more um, software type products available to manage your, your deals. Uh, just to keep track of important dates and uh, timelines or to-do lists. You're really trying to organize uh, your time, um, staying on top of that. But it's funny because people, I feel, they want somebody they can see and talk to and really like confirm that this is a good deal or uh, I really need market knowledge. I, I really need to know somebody who understands traffic patterns and where customers are going to be uh, different areas because uh, a lot of things look good on paper, but it's amazing once you, you talk with the locals in the area, stigmas or um, just historical tendencies of, of an area, you can learn a lot. And it's hard to get that on a computer or an app. So people like to trust other humans and, right. and feel confident in their decision. When you're placing a million dollars, it's something you think about. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, with that, so I know in the residential market, that w there's a local company called Homey here mm -hmm. that you're familiar with, and um, they're trying to really disrupt that real estate agent kind of business. Um, do you see that happening on the commercial side at all? Is Are there any players that are trying to really disrupt the commercial real estate agent business? Yeah, I haven't seen or felt much of a, a pressure in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, I know it's more common in a residential setting because there's so many agents. One of the ways they can compete on getting a listing is by saying I'll do it for 5% or 3% or mm -hmm. Uh, reduce, Price cutting. Yeah, reduce their commission. So uh, it's the, the seller essentially pays less. But in the commercial industry, it's very standard to see a full 6%. And also, the, the times when it does shrink is when your, your deal size gets bigger. When, once you get over like 4 or 5 million, then you'll typically see a commission of 5% or 4%. And that's always split between the buyer's agent and the seller's agent. So mm -hmm. um, I haven't felt much of a, a disruptance by that. I, I'm curious of how residential agents feel about it. Um, mm -hmm. Homey, they market a lot. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people buying homes do uh, look just online. It fills a lot of their needs. But I have personally not used it, so I, I don't know how right. good of a job it does or right. if it serves a lot of the same goals right. as it. Agent. And like you said, commercial is a lot bigger than residential. You're purchasing a lot bigger things, so it's something that you maybe feel less comfortable with just doing online, right? Uh-huh. needs some of that person-to-person -person interaction. Totally. Right. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit, but why, why would you recommend an aspiring entrepreneur to become a commercial real estate agent? I'd say because there's no limit. And I think you'll see that in a lot of sales positions, but you can really create whatever whatever lifestyle or dream that you want in, in commercial real estate, uh, depending on how hard you work. Mm -hmm. And you learn everything's negotiable. You learn the best deals uh, often aren't available, they're not on the market, but you talk to the right people and 
you orchestrate uh, enough parts that that it all falls together and you can create some really cool projects. For me, the other nice thing was coming out of college, I didn't have a lot of money to, to invest or to build my own company. And in brokerage, your biggest capital is your time. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything other than time to make phone calls, talk to property owners, talk to business owners looking for space. And so if you have the time to match these people up, then you get a percentage of the deal that is consummated there and it doesn't take any money out of your pocket. Uh, kind of like a consultant, you just offer your, your expertise and uh, make it happen and then you get a piece of the pie, which is really nice. And then you get enough pieces of the pie to finally go buy your own pie. Mm -hmm. so. Cool, is that what you want to do down the line? Absolutely. I've, I've got uh, multiple offers in on properties right now and working to, to build that personal portfolio. But I think one of the great things about working in real estate too is you see the first deals that become available or you can identify opportunities that aren't necessarily on the market, but you just know if I could get this property and remarket it or make it available, I could make a really good profit. Yeah, really cool. Um, on the flip side, why would you not recommend an aspiring entrepreneur to become a commercial real estate agent? Um, sometimes it's hard not seeing y your results a after the fact. There's not much that changes with a building the day before you sell it and the day after you sell it, mm -hmm. other than money in your the pocket. Owner. Yeah. Yeah. So the cash is nice, but one of the things I love going back to mowing lawns was seeing a really ugly lawn, straggly, overgrown weeds, and an hour or two hours later, it looks immaculate. Hmm. And I can leave feeling like, wow, this looks way better. Um, with real estate, if you just sell a property, there's not much that changes. Um, development's different because you could see uh, depleted apartment building or a junky car repair shop turn into a beautiful apartment building or mm -hmm. um, you, you see the, the city transform. And so being a part of that, yes, that is visible. Um, but as the broker, really, you're um, kind of just facilitating it. You're not actually doing the construction or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I like seeing the results of my work. and. Yeah, I know I play a part in connecting these people who beautify the areas, and but that's not your direct. But yeah, yeah. gotcha. Um, is being a commercial real estate agent? Do you feel like it's very location centered? Like, for example, you're here in Utah. Um, could you just go out to Minnesota and start having the same results, or if you? First started in Minnesota. In Minnesota, can you like switch locations fairly often and, and deliver similar results, or do you feel like it's all just a network, a local network? Yes, it's difficult to to transfer areas because you create a a business and a reputation in an area. So if I were to go to Minnesota, there's not a lot of people in Minnesota that would know my history, and, right? And have seen my signs and my name, and so it is hard. You, um, when you start, you, you want to be pretty bullish on the market that you're going to, mm. um, whether it's for family or for economic reasons. Uh, I think that is important to look at. Could, would I be happy staying here for 10, 15 years? Right. Because uh, I think the longer you stay somewhere, the, the more reputation you'll have. Yeah. Um, and also, your, your license is state-specific, but uh, by working with affiliate brokers and whatnot, you can do transactions outside of the state. So uh, there's companies I represent in multiple states. We identify sites and uh, purchase property in uh, all over the western U.S. And so... And you it, use affiliate brokers. We do, yeah. Uh -huh, and, but and, you're the agent for... Right. Yeah, you're still the agent. So you got to be careful with that to meet all the state requirements, but uh, it does take some time ramping up your market knowledge of that area. Anytime we get a new area, 
I'll go stay there for a couple of days and just drive for eight to 10, 12 hours a day, seeing the streets, seeing the traffic patterns, uh, looking at the centers that are real vibrant and doing well, and reading the newspaper, trying to get plugged into that market as quickly and best you can, talking with the locals, seeing where they like to shop. It's all yeah. important and it just takes time. Right. It takes being there. Okay. Yeah, that's something I definitely wanted to mention on this because if there are people listening that do want to become a commercial real estate agent and they have an opportunity to go out to some other state, it might not just be a, a short-term commitment. It could be very well be a 10, 15-year commitment, right? Yeah, to see some really good success, I would plan on staying long-term. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, just to finish up, just a couple more questions that I have. So what are your thoughts on starting a business in college versus getting more educated, going finishing college first, going and working for someone else for a while? Like, What, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, good question. I would say do it if you can. Um, if you have an opportunity to start a business, I think it's great. I think starting a business is very educational because on the, through the process, you'll learn how to interact with people, how to talk with them, um, problems that companies are facing. I'd also say if you have an opportunity to go work for a company and learn from them, to, to take that too. Um, I think there's a lot of different paths on being successful and some people start a great business when they're 18 and some people start a great business when they're 50. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't think there's one one pathway. One path or one right answer. Like, if you don't have a business by the time you graduate, you're not an entrepreneur. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's certainly not the case. Mm -hmm. um, I think being patient and uh, looking for opportunities wherever you go is the right way to be a, a successful entrepreneur. Awesome. Um, so I'm curious also as to your process of goal setting with because like you said, you, you basically get to define your day every day and you're making calls and emailing and everything. Like, what, How do you set goals? Yeah, I look a lot about, or I look a lot at the outcome. What do I want? Is it um, money? Is it experience? Is it a relationship? And then I set my goals to, to meet those outcomes that I want. Um, if it's important for me to be outside and have a great experience, I'm going to set a priority to go mountain biking. If it's important to make money, I'm going to look at the deal that's closest to, to being completed and pushing it across the finish line. If it's a relationship, I'm going to make sure I take them out to lunch or uh, go and visit somebody so they know um, um, they're their guy. Yeah. So, uh, setting goals to me is all about outcome. What do I want? looking at the outcome first and then uh, deciding what it is I need to do to, to get there. Mm -hmm. So one one last thought that I had, and, and thanks for sharing that, one last thought that I had, um, we'll just finish with this kind of as a question, was, so I was talking to somebody about, who was also uh, commercial real estate, involved in commercial real estate, and he was saying that like he got his first deal done or whatever. And because they're big deals, it's worth a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. And he says it was so awesome. It was like a high. And he says that after a couple of years, though, it just becomes like a rat race in the sense of like you're just looking for that next mm -hmm. big piece and, and it just becomes just this continuous cycle. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious as to your thoughts about that and if that's a good thing or if that's a bad thing. Yeah, it depends if, if that's your thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you love the rat race, a good quote I heard was, an agent's only as good as his next deal. It doesn't really matter what you've done in the past. Um, you're as good as your, your next deal. And so it is important to keep a healthy pipeline. And one of the reasons why I think uh, a lot of agents, after they've started taking a share of all these transactions, they get their commissions, they start rolling it into properties and being owners themselves. Uh, so it's a little bit more stable, but you're absolutely right that um, you eat what you kill, and so you gotta continuously be hunting. And as as soon as you start having your own capital and kind of have that money working for you through investment properties or 
stocks or whatever you decide to do, I think that's really important to maintaining a healthy and balanced life for when recessions come or slowdowns come. Right. Um, you definitely want something that'll sustain you when you don't have a deal. Right. And you already know the business so well that it's not that difficult to make those personal investments. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for being on the, the podcast today and awesome. for this yeah. interview um, and for opening up a lot about just what the day-to-day -day looks like and just the commercial real estate in industry and especially being an agent. Like I think that a lot of people are interested in, in doing similar things. They just don't really know about it. So thanks for coming on, Chase. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. Great to be here. Hey, thank you for listening to the Entrepreneur on Campus podcast, this interview with Chase Bryan. It's been a pleasure to interview these individuals and to develop relationships with them. And I think that there's a lot of learning to be done. And I feel like throughout these a little bit less than 20 interviews that I've done, I've, I've learned so much about the business world. And, and I feel like I, I understand some of the industries just a lot more in depth, which is great because now I can, I can look and evaluate what opportunities I want to pursue more. Um, if you guys haven't noticed, I started a, an Instagram page called Entrepreneur on Campus, as well as a Facebook page called Entrepreneur on Campus. So if you guys can go follow that every once a week, I'm going to be posting just a photo of, um, the interview that I did just so that everybody's aware that there was recently an interview launched and I've also created it. I've created these platforms so that I can get feedback. I love to hear feedback, and um, I'm just getting going with it, so if you could help by following my page, Entrepreneur on Campus, on Instagram and Facebook, that would be super helpful, sharing it with friends. So thank you guys again for listening. I wish you all the best with your lives, and go get it. Love you. Have a good one.